We are continuing our series through the top thousand games on Board Game Geek, going 100 games at a time and choosing 10 that we really love. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the Brothers Murph, and that's right. So this list right here, we're going to be going through 700 to 601 and picking our top 10 favorite games from that list as of right now. We don't have to put the caveat that this is from when we looked at this list and recorded sure. it. By the time this comes out, the list will assuredly maybe be different. BGG is a living, breathing it's moving organism. Around constantly, right? constantly, especially up here. The top 100 is harder to crack than the yes. top 100, but at this point, like things move in and out constantly. Exactly. So this is from when we recorded. These are our 10 favorite games from this 100, and then after this, we're starting to get into like the close yes. to the top half there, which is pretty cool. It's getting tough. But let's go ahead and get into it. Our number 10 is a game that does something that I absolutely love, and that allows me to do whatever I want, and that is QE. QE is an auction bidding game where you'll be bidding on different different essentially infrastructures or different kinds of industries i suppose is what it is uh from different countries so like agriculture and and uh, uh other stuff finance things like that and they have different countries as well like i think america and in uh england and china and india i believe and so uh, essentially like this is going to be a a uh, american financial institution basically is what this is and you are bidding on those things trying to gain them if you gain uh industries of your country everyone has their own country, uh, you'll get extra bonuses, uh, you'll get extra points, and then you want to try and get a lot of, it's kind of one of those games where you can go a lot of the same thing, you can have a really diverse one, it kind of just depends on what you want to go for that game, but here's the kicker, you can bid whatever you want, apparently these countries are allowed to just print money and inflation doesn't exist, <laughs> or maybe it does, who knows, um, but nonetheless, you can bid, bid 10 bucks, or you could bid 10 quadrillion dollars, it's up to you. And so it's really, really fun. But the real kicker of the game is at the end of the game, the person who spent the most money automatically loses. They're just automatically out. They're out of the game, can't do anything about it. And so you want to spend money to get these things, but you can't spend too much money. It's kind of like High Society has a similar mechanic, really, really fun. And it's just fun. And this is one of those games where I'm like, yo, don't play this game and only be bidding like $1,000. The point is you can bid an infinite amount of money bid bonkers like start off at 10 million just just start off at 10 million it's just so much fun i really like qe i just love the crazy nature of it. it's a really great con game it's super fun so number nine is my little scythe this is uh, uh serves as kind of an introduction to a scythe game uh, that a father and daughter actually made originally based off My Little Pony, which according they couldn't use that for a theme, but they made My Little Scythe, uh, which is just a really fantastic way to give you a lot of the vibes, a lot of the action types that you're doing in Scythe, but in a quicker, more family friendly, it's not a kid's game per se, but it, you know, the things you're doing in the game are kind of more family friendly. Some of the actions and things are just a little bit simplified and it's just a little bit shorter than Scythe would be, which can be kind of a really brutal efficiency race where you need to be up and at them quick and getting your objectives met or else you're gonna fall behind the rest of the pack. So My Little Scythe is about putting out friendship into the world and, and uh, you know, getting pie instead of uh, power and you can have a pie fight and throw pies at each other. But there's so much that's, so much of the game is based on doing friendly acts to gain kind of these friendship, which would be like your popularity in Scythe. And I love that you can kind of try to be the friendliest person possible and there's lots of ways that you can kind of gain that, that friendship. And if you have a pie fight, you actually lose friendship. It's not a nice thing to do, but you can do it. And it's a way to potentially get one of your objectives met, one of your trophies. So this just takes everything in Scythe and puts it into like a beautifully colorful land where your pawns are now the kind of animals from Scythe. They're sort of the main characters. And I think it's just really beautiful and colorful and fun and makes me happy to look at. And one that at certain points I'm like, I don't really want to get into something heavy like Scythe but I'll play this game right here and I get a lot of that feeling of the mechanics of Scythe, but in such a fun kind of adorable package. It's just a delight. We really enjoy it. And I think it's a great way to introduce the idea of Scythe to people without having to jump fully into playing Scythe. Number eight is a game by Phil Walker Harding, Praise B. 
praise be to Phil Walker Harding always. And this might be my favorite Phil Walker Harding game. This is Cacao. I really, really like Cacao. Cacao is a game where you are building out kind of a, a jungle essentially and you are getting uh, cacao plantations and then you are selling cacao to these different, to like different markets. You're coming across like water and various temples and stuff, but it's got this really interesting like checkerboard tile mechanic where you have your tiles, which are gonna have a certain amount of people on them, a certain amount of workers. Uh, they're always gonna have four, but the where they're distributed within the tile is what's gonna be different. They're gonna be along the sides. So it might be like, you're gonna have one on each side, or two and two, or one and three, or two, one and one. And essentially, you're gonna put that tile out next to some jungle tiles, and then the amount of workers pointing at that jungle tile, they then get to activate that tile the same amount of time as there are workers. So if there's two workers, they get to activate that tile twice. And then as you get worker tiles, if you have a worker tile and a worker tile kind of like diagonally adjacent to each other, you are then gonna fill in that other spot with a jungle tile. So it'll always go checkerboard pattern between your worker tiles and then the different jungle tiles. So one of the cool things about this game is it's kind of got this, this delayed action thing going on because if you have workers all around your tile, but where you put it only activates one thing, then later if someone fills in that spot with the jungle tile, you then get to activate it because at the, when you put it down there, there was nothing there, but now something is. So you still get to activate the things later. It's really, really fun. You're essentially trying to get money. You have your own little, uh, little like river track. You're trying to go up the river. It's really, really cool. Super simple, classic praise beef of Uncle Harding game. It's so much fun. Number seven is Merv, The Heart of the Silk Road. This is an absolutely awesome action selection game where you are gonna be moving uh, pawns around the city of Merv. And you're gonna be moving uh, on four sides of the square, doing that three times, there's three rounds in the game. And as you go, you're going to add a meeple to kind of one of the building tiles in that row or column, depending on where you are around the city. And then you're gonna be able to activate uh, the resources from all of those buildings in that row or column that have your workers on them, your kind of building markers. So you're kind of building out, ideally, at least every other turn where you're kind of on one side, a really powerful row or column for yourself where you get to generate a lot of resources and then you can activate one of those buildings uh, in that row or column to generate to kind of take one of four actions, essentially. You can kind of do some caravan stuff where you're trading spices around, which is a set collection element of the game. You can build up walls around the city of Murph because you're being attacked <laughs> by outside forces. So you need to have walls to protect your buildings and therefore your building markers from being destroyed and having to lose kind of the progress you had on building up the town. Uh, you can kind of trade with nearby cities uh, and you can work up a mosque track. Uh, there's a lot of fun and interest in, in focusing on any of those four areas. And you should probably focus on one or two of the areas instead of all four in the game. But I just love the action selection system, moving around the board and how you build up your rows and columns to, to generate as many resources as possible. And what is ultimately a game where you have limited time, you have 12 turns. That's not a lot of time and you can get a lot done by the way you build up the city. It's got a lot of really interesting stuff. It's beautiful art by Eno Tool. Maybe for my money, the most beautiful Eno you know, Tool game, which is really saying something because every Eno you know, Tool game is kind of the most beautiful Eno you know, Tool game. <laughs> but we really like uh, Merv, The Heart of the Silk Road. Number six is kind of my favorite go-to, it's my favorite crisis management game. That's The Loop. I really like cooperative crisis management games like Pandemic, things where there's a bunch of crazy crap happening and you're having to deal with it as it comes out. You don't know what's gonna come out. You don't know what cities are gonna go up in flames in Pandemic. You just have to deal with it once it gets there. That's what The Loop is about. The Loop is a game where you're going up against uh, Dr. Foe who is going through time and setting out his clones all throughout times. So you're setting them in the end of times, you're setting them into um, the Renaissance times, the age of antiquity, and they're essentially messing stuff up because there's going to be certain things to be like, for every clone that's in this area, do this kind of thing. They're really, really bad. And so what you're trying to do then is get those clones back to the time period that they came from. So if you get a Renaissance clone back to the Renaissance, they like explode, basically. They, they essentially, I don't know, time makes sense again and everything's fine. So 
you have all these clones going everywhere, but every single round, you're gonna have to drop these red cubes into this cube tower, and they're gonna spread out into the different, the seven different regions. It's a, sep a septagonal board, and they're gonna be spreading out. And if you ever get more than, I think, three in a region, that region has like a time vortex happen. And the, the, um, the, uh, well, the objective, that's a word, Nick, objective. The objective at the top of that region now goes away. And what you're trying to do is complete these objectives. The objectives might be like, use a certain amount of energy cubes in these regions, get a certain amount of clones back to these regions, different kinds of objectives like that. But when a vortex happens, you lose that one and you just can't do it, it's gone now. If you ever have three vortexes, you just lose the game. And every person has a special character that can do certain things. You have your own cards and you're also gaining cards throughout the game that are gonna allow you to do stuff. It's really, really fun and feels very cooperative because one thing you can do is put out these green cubes, which are energy cubes, and you can kind of put them out like, okay, I'm gonna put this one over here so that you can use it on your turn. I'm gonna use this one here. And basically on these cards, there's going to be these different symbols and you can use the symbols and what you can do then is loop. And what you can do is loop is you can take off an energy cube and then you can turn back all the cards of one symbol. And then you can now use them again because they're activated. And then you can turn in two energy to loop again. But then it's gonna cost you three energy. But you technically could loop as long as you have energy to do so. So you can put together these really cool turns because you're like, doo -doo -doo, loop, doo -doo -doo, go over here, loop, doo -doo -doo, go over here, loop, and really put together some awesome turns. It's super, super fun. I love the loop. I really want to start playing it solo because I hear it's got a really good solo mode. The loop is such a good time, like a crisis management game. Number five is Onirim or Onirim. This is a solitaire card game where you are, are navigating dreams and nightmares. You're trying to play out different dream cards, which are gonna be different colors of cards with symbols, and you're trying to put them into an order where you play three of a color in a row, but you can't repeat the same symbol twice. As you play out these cards, you hopefully play those cards in such a way that you gain keys, which are gonna help you escape this dream. Because there's nightmare cards that might come up, and every time a nightmare card comes up, you have to shuffle your deck of cards, you lose progress on things that you've been doing, uh, and you have to lose cards off your deck, which wastes time. And if you get all the way through that deck and you haven't escaped the dream and you need two keys of each color, so there's like blue and red, uh, and black, and if you don't get out of the dream, you're stuck in the nightmare forever. This is one that's just a really interesting, kind of simple rule set about kind of putting out those cards, but man, it's brutal because there's those nightmares floating around. Every time you shuffle the deck, those nightmares go back into your deck, so they start showing up more and more and more. You can discard keys and things to, to, to kind of shoo the nightmare away, but either way, every time they pop up, it just hampers your progress in a way that you're like, okay, how do I get out of this dream? And it just creates a really fun, really repeatable puzzle that has kind of really beautiful art. That is an Irem. Uh, it's really fun. There's a great app for it. We can play it if you don't want to have to shuffle those cards all the time. You can get an app that shuffles them for you. It's really great. Uh, we highly recommend it. Number four is gonna be a great Mahjong inspired game, and that is Dragon Castle. So Dragon Castle is a game where you have a big uh, central board with these kind of Mahjong-like tiles, really heavy, beautiful um, tiles, really good table presence this game. And essentially you're gonna have to take one of the face-up tiles from the top floor, whatever that floor is, and then you can take another tile that has the exact same color and the exact same amount of um, of symbols on it from anywhere else that's available. And then what you'll do is you'll put them onto your personal board and you'll put them down and you're trying to make, put like colors next to each other. If you ever have four like colors next to each other, they will flip over and you'll get to put a shrine down there. And you're essentially putting shrines to, uh, uh, to these great spirit dragons. Uh, it's a very abstract game, but it's got a really cool look and kind of a cool theme as well. And then the higher up those shrines are, the more points they're worth. And so 
you are putting now when you put stuff down if you have things flipped over you can now put tiles on top of those tiles and it's really really fun little puzzly game where you're drafting tiles from this main area trying to get the like tiles and there's certain tiles that are more um, valuable than other ones certain ones that are more simple it's just really really cool really beautiful abstract strategy game that just works and it flows and it's just kind of one of those games you can play like at the end of a night it's not going to be super stressful you can kind of just draft some tiles put them here trying to score trying to get your shrine high up it's just really really fun number three is all about running a tv station this is the networks this is a, a game where we haven't seen like themes like this too much there's like roll camera and things but uh, i think uh you know tv studios or hollywood's an infinitely interesting part of the world that we should see more board games that have these kinds of themes the network is all about running the most powerful TV station gaining as many viewers as possible. And you're gonna do that by populating the prime time hours, eight, nine, and 10 p.m. with the best shows you can, attaching stars to those shows, attaching ads, all to generate viewers and revenue. In this game, uh, certain shows, uh, first of all, all the shows are, are parodies of all your favorite shows uh, from the past. All the, all the actors and things you can attach are people who are very much based on like, oh, that's definitely Arnold Schwarzenegger, for example. <laughs> but they don't say that. It's just like the action hero and things like that. So all these actors will come with different boons and things if you can put them on the type of show they're known for. Like an action star wants to be on an action show because that's what they're known for. That's going to make your show more appealing and actually increase the amount of viewers that come to watch the show. What's really cool though, is at the end of every round, there's five rounds in the game, you age your shows. So a show that just debuted this season will go into season two in the next round, where oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the show becomes even more popular and gains more viewers. But there might come a time where a show, now it's in its third or fourth season even, and it really has diminishing returns. That show is not as popular as it once was, and you might have to make the decision to cancel some shows and bring in a new show in at 10 p.m. to freshen things up at the network. And I just love that in a game because that is reality. No show can last forever. Not every show is It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which seems endless. <laughs> a lot of shows kind of like have a three, four season run and they're kind of like, we're sort of beyond the best episodes. The best episodes are behind us, aren't they? And so making those decisions of when to you know, change out shows, the kind of humor that's uh, on the cards and the, the balancing act of a star might bring you a bunch of views, but they cost extra money. So how do I manage the actual like production costs of the shows I have? Let me balance it out with some ad revenue from you know putting those on the APM slot. We're gonna sell this weird product, which has its own humor in itself. There's so much fun stuff. And it's just a really cool theme for a board game that we don't see nearly enough of, in my opinion, that is the networks. Number two is Shakespeare. Shakespeare is, oh, one of the most underrated games on the planet. It's so good. This is my, one of Mike and I's real evangelism games. We talk about this game a lot and we really try and get people to play it because Mike does theater. I used to do theater back in the day. So we're big fans of Shakespeare and theater in general. But this is a game where you are Shakespeare and you're putting on a play and you are everyone, I guess everyone is Shakespeare in this game. It's basically the loop, everyone's a clone. Um, but basically you're trying to put on the best play because whoever puts on the best play, the queen will then come to see your show and you win the game. And so this is a really interesting interesting game where there's essentially three of these tracks that you're trying to go up and those are the three acts of the play act one act two and act three so throughout the game you can kind of choose which acts to do more of you're like you know what? here's the act one trash but we're gonna really we're gonna land we're gonna really stick the landing on act three and you're trying to get prestige which is the points in this game and you are drafting these various um shakespearean characters like you know hamlet and king lear and you know um Lady Macbeth and all the classics basically. And you can also get different like set dressers, you can get different uh, costume designers because all of your actors and actresses need to be in costumes. They're not gonna go out there naked. That would be ridiculous. This isn't hair. Um, and so you're, you have to put them in, in uh, costumes. You can build up your set and it's just a really tight game because this game you have, um, you have uh, action discs, you have five of them, and you're gonna bid based on how many you're gonna use. And whoever bids the lowest gets to go first. So if you choose two and no one else chooses two, you're gonna get to go first. But that means you're only doing two actions. And this game is very restrictive in that way. I still really enjoy it, 
But then they came out with, in my opinion, I think Mike's opinion as well, the greatest expansion ever made, and that is Shakespeare Backstage. And what Backstage does is it lays out a couple different cards, just a deck of cards. It's like a little $10, $15 expansion. So good, so much bang for your buck in that expansion. But basically now any actions you didn't bid with, you didn't use, you now get to use in the backstage, which just makes the game so much more open and so much better because now bidding low isn't like the end of the world because you now can do stuff in the backstage and it just makes it so good. Shakespeare is one of those games that just like, it's so amazing, it's so beautiful, it's just such a cool theme. This is a game we'll just I'll talk about till the end of days because we love it. I don't think it's in print anymore, unfortunately, um, but I wish it would come back because gosh, it's just so darn good. We love it so much. Number one, frankly, I'm offended is so low. This is Cribbage. Cribbage, of course, is our number one from this section. Cribbage is so important to us personally. We, we, played cribbage way before we knew about modern board games. Most people have played cribbage way before they knew about modern board games. This is of course a classic card game. They have a little board that you can keep your score on, usually a wooden board. Our grandfather has made many custom boards in his life that we all kind of have <laughs> shared around with the family now uh, as a way to remember him. And uh, he's the person that taught us cribbage. Uh, this is a great game for us that we really appreciate because it helped teach us like math and adding. Uh, it helped teach us, you know, how to like look for points in hands and, and pattern recognition, all sorts of great stuff. And probably in the way, in a way helped pave, you know, smooth the road for us becoming board gamers because of some of those skills that we developed back when we were just doing cribbage, which is sort of like a casual pastime. Uh, this is one for us. I'm like, for so many people, I feel like cribbage is a part of history and family and legacy and, and kind of something that gets passed on, a generational thing, that I'm a little surprised that it's this low <laughs> on the overall rankings. Maybe not enough people have tried Cribbage yet, but it's a great classic 52 deck of card card game. Uh, one that we uh, have loved our whole life. I can't wait to pass it on to my daughter and, and, and teach her. Uh, such a classic thing that has brought a lot of kind of happiness to my whole family. So that is Cribbage. So those are 10 more games from uh, the top thousand board game geek this time, 700 to 601 yeah. that we quite enjoy. There's really so many good games. It's just gonna keep getting better throughout. <laughs> it's just gonna keep getting better. The top thousand, it's crazy. <laughs> it's gonna start getting, it's gonna start getting really hard. Yeah, we're gonna start making some <laughs> breaking decisions. Lives. But down in the comments below, look at this top 100 and let us know what your top 10 games, people have been doing this throughout this whole series. It's been really, really cool to read and watch. Really fun to follow along. So uh, put down your top 10 games from this particular 100. And let's go through this whole journey together. Let's do it. Until next time, I'm Mike. I'm Nick. We'll We'll see y'all in the next top 10, everybody. Bye.